Welcome to this first lecture of the course Reinforcement Learning at Paderborn University. My name is Oliver Walchert and I will be your lecturer for this video series. During our today's first appointment, we will have a bird's eye view on the fundamentals of reinforcement learning. And the today's agenda is structured as can be seen here. We will first have a general administrative uh, course framework overview, so how is that course, um, is that course hosted? Then a very first glimpse, what is reinforcement learning? So what are we talking about here? Some application examples and a very brief historic review. Then in the center of that today's talk, we will talk a lot about the basic terminology, about the basic, basic terms we need to know to uh, communicate about reinforcement learning. Then we will differentiate different categories of reinforcement learning algorithms. How can we solve reinforcement learning problems? And then finally, we will have a small comparison to model predictive control because this course will have the specific focus on control problems using reinforcement learning. And in this sense, model predictive control is also a very typical, typical solution candidate. And therefore, we want to see similarities and differences of reinforcement learning and model predictive control. I'm not giving this entire course by my own. I have a strong teaching team uh, besides me. And here I would like to mention Wilhelm Kirchgesner, Max Schenk and Daniel Weber, which will host especially the tutorials and exercises uh, accompanying this, uh, this lecture and this entire course. And uh, Wilhelm will also give a special lecture on supervised learning and using uh, deep function approximators. If you have any question, um, please let us know, uh, either directly by email or even better using Pandar. So everyone who is enrolled for that course at Paderborn University should be already uh, also enrolled for that uh, Panda course. So Panda is a Moodle clone, an open source learning management system. And as you can see here also from that screenshot, we already have uh, started up some, some lecture and exercise forum. So if you have any content related or administra administrative communication question, please ask them uh, in particular inside that uh, Panda course forum. Uh, we will then open our, yeah open discussion with you, a public discussion with you, and we believe that this discussion will also help other uh, students in order to to follow the uh, lecture or the exercises even a little bit better. Also, the entire course material and homework deliverables will be sended in both directions via Panda, so we will provide you the materials there, and if we have any homework deliverable, you will be able to send it uh, also via Panda. Also very important, maybe as a side note here, we are giving that lecture, that entire course for the very first time as a teaching team. So if you have any uh, criticism, if you have any things uh, to, to uh, light up, so uh, any typos or things like that, please let us know immediately. We are highly appreciating any advice, any hint on errors or things which we could improve uh, for the future. And uh, yeah, any hint is highly appreciated. The examination regulations of that course are not 100% clear at the moment because, yeah, as you may know, we are in a somewhat special situation this semester. It will be digital semester. So we are waiting on guidelines from the University Executive Board on how to proceed or how to plan with the final exams. But at the moment, there is a very high chance that it will be either single oral examination or written examination at the end of the um, yeah, normal semester time. However, we don't have a final decision yet because we're waiting for that regulations, but we will let you know as, as soon as possible and we just ask for your patience. Nevertheless, uh, what is 100% clear already is that this course will come with three homework assignments, homework sheets, and each of these homework sheets will have an editing time of roughly one to two weeks. And it's will uh, very largely based on coding problems with a little bit of classical uh, question and answer queries. So the coding, I can already say that will be largely based on Python. So that's why we already have a first exercise uh, available for you on Panda uh, on the basics of Python. So if you're not familiar with that program language, please have a view also at that uh, first exercise tutorial and get yourself familiar with that program language. You will really need it for all subsequent exercises and also for that homework assignment. And now at the beginning of the course time, you really have the time to dig deeper into that uh, program and language and then to use it throughout uh, the course. The homework assignments will be are distributed equally over the lecture time. So the first homework assignment you can plan with after one third. 
uh, of the course time, then the second one roughly after the 50-60% uh, of the lecture time, and then the last one at the end. The homework sheet is parsed if you obtain 50% or more of the points. So um, each homework sheet will have uh, points on it, so you see which subtasks are weighted uh, a little bit more or a little bit less. And if in total you are able to get that 50% or more points, then uh, you're good to go. And the regulations will look like follows. So you will be admitted, um, or you will get admission to the uh, final exam if you uh, at minimum pass two out of that three tests. And there's also a bonus. So if you're able to pass all three tests, then you will get a one third grade step of your uh, final examination mark. The general course outline though for that entire semester is very roughly sketched as uh, stated here. So today we will start with conceptual basic, historical overview and so on. Then uh, next lecture we will have a very detailed discussion on Markov decision processes followed by dynamic programming, Monte Carlo learning, temporal difference learning, bootstrapping and different on and off policy strategies will be discussed throughout the entire way. This entire block here, let's say first block of course topics will be largely based on so-called tabular methods, so methods which can be easily implemented using standard uh, lookup tables, for example, um, simple memory blocks and things like that. It will be more or less the first half or first 60% of the course. And then on top of that, we will also have a look at deep learning techniques using function approximators, such as neural networks or other machine learning type function approximators. And then of course also uh, other, let's say more advanced uh, reinforcement learning techniques, for example, policy gradient methods will be on the course outline. If we have time uh, at the end of the semester, we cannot really say it uh, at the moment for, for sure if that time is available. But if, then we would like also to uh, have a glimpse at topics of safe reinforcement learning, because as you may know, reinforcement learning is highly data driven and data driven algorithms have uh, some, yeah, maybe numerical problems or safety problems from a technical point of view. And we would like to discuss these issues with you together. And then also integration of expert knowledge. So there's always this compromise. We're following a data driven approach or maybe something which is highly relating on expert knowledge. So this is always a trade off in any decision making algorithm like reinforcement learning. And we would like also to integrate that if the time is uh, available for that. Also very important, of course, this is not the first lecture in the entire world on reinforcement learning. And that's why this lecture is highly based on similar or previous lecture books and lecture uh, slide shows. So uh, the most, I believe, famous book on that is the reinforcement learning an introduction by Sutton and Bato, which is available in the 2018 edition either uh, as a yeah, book in our library or, or you will also find an electronic copy of that entire uh, PDF uh, book uh, in Panda. And secondly, we are highly also relating to the reinforcement learning lecture of David Silver. His entire lecture slide set is available also on Panda for your convenience. And his YouTube lecture series is also available if you click on uh, this link here. Last but not least, also highly recommended is the book of Berzikas, Reinforcement Learning and Optimal Control, which unfortunately is not available as an electronic copy. But uh, if you like, you can find also a book uh, or several books of it in our library. Yeah, after that administrative outlook, how the course will be structured, we are now going to get the first glimpse on reinforcement learning. So what is it? Reinforcement learning is basically a technique in order to make optimal decisions. And that optimal decisions in that figure have to be done by the agent. That agent is somehow sitting inside um, something I would call an optimization loop. So in each time step, the agent is emitting an action to an environment. So an environment is, for example, a technical system or a game or a maze like in this picture here. And inside this environment and the system, something is happening based on that action. So for example, if you're going inside that maze, that action could be your next position, your next move. And then of course, what would be the environment response that would be your new position. So the state then, which is the environment's response is basically just that information uh, on, let's say the internal dynamics, the internal mechanics of that given technical system or game system or whatsoever. 
However, normally there is also an interpreter between the environment and the agent, which is somehow processing that state response by the environment. So that could be, for example, a measurement unit, sensors, something like that, which are translating the state information to the observations, so to our measurements. Also very important inside that interpreter, we are rewarding, we are interpreting that state information and giving a reward to the agent. And we will discuss all the different topics, agent, uh, action, state, reward, observation, and so on, also in the subsequent slides in a more deep way. Here it's also important to note that during the entire course we will stick to a more control theory based nomenclature and that's why the action here is u, the state is x, the observation or measurement is y. In other reinforcement learning books, as I've also stated them uh, two or three slides uh, back, you will find that the observation for example is an o, the action is an a and the state is an s. However, as we are having a control theory background and also this lecture will have a slightly larger touch into that direction, we will stick to the reinforce uh, to the control theory nomenclature. So to summarize, what are the key characteristics of reinforcement mm -hmm. learning? We can state mm -hmm. first there is no supervisor, so nobody is telling this little agent here what is an optimal action to, for example, maximize this reward here. So the agent really has to find out that optimal behavior by its own. It's also largely data driven. So emitting that action and getting back a state feedback in terms of a reward and observation, this, these are data streams uh, and therefore the agent is acting or is interacting with the environment on a data-driven uh, fashion. Also, we will assume or we will focus on setups where the entire, yeah, the entire loop here is operating on a discrete time interval. So this time interval index k are denoting discrete time steps. Also very important, it's a sequential decision-making problem and therefore the entire data stream is sequential and we don't have any identically uh, distributed or independent identically distributed data as it would be a classical assumption, for example, in supervised learning. So everything here, the actions, the states, the rewards, the observations are highly linked to each other, obviously because the agent is sitting inside uh, this uh, optimization loop here and is affecting the subsequent data by its decision. So what is happening at every time step k? And we can distinguish there two perspectives. The first perspective is from the agent point of view. So in, at each time step k, the agent is picking an action. So picking the action, putting it to the environment, and it receives an observation y and a reward k. On the other side, we also can make this distinction from the environment's point of view. So the environment pretty much receives that action from the agent and then emits an observation in reward. But now it's very important here at time step k plus one. So inside the environment, and this is a very important assumption of most reinforcement learning system models, that we have a time delay here between the action played to the environment, emitted to the environment, and the state response by the environment. So actually that yk and rk the uh, agent receives is delayed by one time step. So very important assumption. And um, yeah, remark on that time here is also that in the entire lecture, in the entire course, we will assume that this time delay between two time steps, so delta t here, is always a constant. So there is no situation where the time uh, passed between two sampling steps, k, k plus one is different. Of course, there could be uh, situations, controlling situations, for example, where the controller is asynchronously interrupted and not synchronously interrupted, but we don't focus on these special situations here. So we will stick to the simple case where delta t is always constant. So the question of that section is what is reinforcement learning and so these previous two pictures or one picture and a little, little bit of explanation was more or less on the technical let's say optimization side but we can of course also ask this question from a more general definition point of view and reinforcement learning basically consists of 
to expressions, reinforcement and learning. And for the term reinforcement, I've brought a quote from Wikipedia, which basically says that reinforcement is a consequence applied that will strengthen an organism's future behavior whenever that behavior is preceded by a specific antecedent stimulus. There are two types of reinforcement known as positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement. Positive is whereby a reward is offered on expression of the wanted behavior and negative is taking away an undesirable element in the person's environment whenever the desired behavior is achieved. So this is a, let's say, a more broader scope of um, reinforcement, not only from optimal decision making, but also from a psychology point of view. And then learning the second term of ARL is stated here from Brown and others. Acquiring knowledge and skills and having them readily available from memory so you can make sense of future problems and opportunities. So here I believe pretty much the buzzwords are memory, which is also highly translated to the technical optimal decision making. So we are saving past observation, past experience we have, we have obtained as an agent and trying to make better choices for the future in order to achieve certain goals. The context around reinforcement learning is largely based on machine learning. So in machine learning we have classically three branches, unsupervised learning, supervised learning and reinforcement learning. Unsupervised learning is just operating on input data only, so we don't have any output data. We're only processing or interpreting a one set of data types. Classical tasks here are then clustering or dimension reduction and typically Unsupervised learning can be used as an auxiliary pre-processing step in order to apply feature engineering, for example, for supervised learning, but also for reinforcement learning problems. Supervised learning then is maybe the largest research domain and teaching domain inside machine learning. Here we have input data, which are mapped to output data. And the main task of super, uh, supervised learning algorithms is to find models, machine learning based models in order to explain these relationship. Tasks here are, for example, regression tasks or classification tasks. Supervised learning can be also used as an auxiliary method for reinforcement learning, especially in deep reinforcement learning, where we use classical supervised learning models such as deep artificial neural networks as function approximators. And that's why we will also have a spe special le lecture on supervised learning and function approximators at the mid of this course. Then reinforcement learning, of course, obviously the core component of this course, everything on how to make optimal decision, optimal control in order to maximize the long-term reward. And here, one very important point is that we can distinguish two different kinds of approaches. The one reinforcement learning approach is the, let's say, standard default approach, the single agent approach where we have one agent which is interacting with an environment and is trying to maximize its reward on its own. So this is the, the default case and in this course we will focus solely on the single agent case. And however there's a second approach, so-called multi-agent approach. So we have multiple agents typically operating with multiple environments or an environment which is highly structured, for example a distributed energy grid or something like that. And in this case, the things are getting a little bit more complicated and other types of algorithms are more interesting than in the single agent case, but we won't um, go into details regarding multi-agent um, reinforcement learning. So the focus of this course is really single agent reinforcement learning. And if you're interested into multi-agent reinforcement learning, I'm referring to other lectures which are more focusing on this application type. Then another context view around machine learning, which is um, yeah also hosting, of course, reinforcement learning, is this picture here. So machine learning is a part of the so-called artificial intelligence, AI, and AI can be summarized at any device that perceives its environment and takes actions that maximizes the chance of successfully achieving its goal. AI is often used to describe machines that mimic cognitive functions that humans associate with the human mind. Of course, AI has a much broader scope compared to machine learning, for example, robotics, uh, brain simulation, cognitive science, and things like that are also part of AI, but uh, are only loosely connected to machine learning. A very special part then of machine learning, which we will also you know, focus or which we will also use in the second part of this course series, is so-called deep learning. 
and deep learning can be classified as a as a class of machine learning techniques which is using very huge layered models for example large artificial neural, neural networks to extract more information from the given data so this is a technique especially in reinforcement learning which is used to address large state spaces and action spaces so highly complicated problems yeah so the reinforcement learning is of course not only linked to engineering a mathematics or computer science problem as we can see here in that figure from david silver but it's also linked to economics psychology neuroscience and so on with this figure i just want to emphasize that our focus here in that lecture at paderborn university will be clearly in the engineering domain with some side views in computer science and mathematics but engineering will be clearly the focus so if you like to get more information on reinforcement learning with one of the other domains uh, not mentioned or which i didn't focus here in that lecture series then please have a view into uh, the lecture books for example in the book of uh, bato and sutton you will find a nice chapter on the connection of reinforcement learning from or not only one chapter but multiple chapters on psychology and reinforcement learning just as a hint after this first bird's eye view on reinforcement learning we now want to give you a very short historical review and some application examples the origins of reinforcement learning can be stated back more than 100 years into the past Ivan Pavlov have to be named from the psychology point of view which was working with classical conditioning for example to impress a certain behavior on animals like dogs so he was very famous for the so-called Pavlov's dogs experiment then from a mathematical, mathematical point of view Andrei Markov a Russian mathematician uh, was highly contributing to the field of formalism describing reinforcement learning problem, problems for example by Markov change and Markov decision problems which we will focus in our second lecture finally here on that slide Richard Bellman has to be named for contributing to problem solving algorithms by for example dynamic programming and he will uh, be focused in our third lecture at this point we could now talk hours for hours on the history of reinforcement learning 19th century 20th century and the most recent developments however as time is short i've just summarized for you some information sources you could use if you like to dig deeper into that topic in the book of Sato, uh, Button and Sato, you will find chapter 1.7, which is giving you a nice summary around the history of reinforcement learning. Sato himself also made a 30 minutes talk on a recent conference, which is available by that YouTube link. And for the most recent developments in terms of deep reinforcement learning, I can highly recommend you this freely available archive.org paper. Leaving the past behind us, we now want to have a view on contemporary application examples which is summarized here on that slide this is a link list so you can click on all the different items here and you will be redirected mostly to youtube videos and as you can see here from that summary there are a lot of different working examples so we have works inside the roboter domain car driving so either even drives uh, remote controlled cars autonomous cars but also like games and economic problems so because time is short you may want to have a view on the different topics here by your own and i just want to focus on a very classical control type of problem the so-called inverted pendulum or swinging up and balance a card pool what is it so the card pool will be shown in just a second so here it is so the card pool is basically a mover a slider on your yeah, linear axis here it can just move to the right and to the left and it's accelerated by this motor here which is aligned or which is directly connected to that movement axis here the reinforcement learning agent um his or its objective here is to swing up that pole which is directly mounted to that um yeah mover here the pole itself doesn't have a certain motor it's just swung up by the right and left movement of the of the slider and the goal is to swing it up into the upright position and then balance it there at the beginning of these trials as you can see the agents uh, which is yeah trained here is not really aware of its environment it's starting with more or less random actions so with random movements trying to learn something about its environment and over time it's getting more and more information and is therefore um, yeah, defining a more let's say successful policy uh, yeah, and is 
getting more information about the environment. Here, after 180 steps, the agent is the first time able to balance the pole for a short amount of time in the upright position, but then loses tracks. And then here, after uh, yeah, roughly 227 trials, it's even better. So it's able to stabilize it for yeah, a little bit longer time. And then shortly after, we can see here the final controller setup where the controller or where the agent is able to stabilize the pole in the upright position permanently and even with short uh, and small disturbances from the left and uh, from the uh, left hand side we can see that the agent is working well with these disturbances so this is a very classical application example i can also just recommend going through the other examples if you find time and um, i believe from that list you will see that using reinforcement learning is really a very general approach in order to solve optimization or decision making problems from a broad range of applications as classical engineering, robotic, automotive cars, or even computer games and stock trading. In the next section, we are going to discuss with you the basic vocabulary of reinforcement learning approaches. And this vocabulary is summarized here. We will talk about reward and returns, state and action. So this was mainly summarized already in the first figure on one of the first slides. And then from that, we will derive what is the policy, what are value functions, what is a model in the sense of reinforcement learning, and what is the so-called exploration-exploitation dilemma. First, let's discuss the reward. The reward is from the medical point of view a scalar quantity, so always one-dimensional. And from a general point of view, we consider the reward as a random variable because there might be stochastic influences in a certain environment. So, for example, if you assume to fly a helicopter, remote controlled helicopter, you may do the same maneuver 10 times successfully and the 11th time there is a very strong wind gust pushing your helicopter into the tree. So in these series of 10 successful runs you will get of course a positive reward, everything went well, your maneuver was looking fine and then in this 11 times where the stochastic influence of wind was blowing you into that tree, of course you won't get a positive reward, you get a penalty for example or at least not as a good reward as before. Therefore, mathematically, we can distinguish random variables as capital letters, so large R at time step k, and realizations as a small letter r. The reward itself can be considered dependent on its application, so there is not too many constraints on that. It could be a real number or also integer number, so this is really highly application dependent. The reward function, which is stated inside the interpreter may be naturally given. For example, in game situation, you either lose or you uh, win a game. Um, yeah, so in this case, it will be naturally given or it's in many other situations, for example, in control situations, is a, a design degree of freedom. So the engineer, the data scientist, the computer scientist has to state what is the reward function, how to design it. And as we also will discuss during the next couple of slides, that design de uh, degree of freedom is very important important for successful reinforcement learning applications. Then, as we already discussed at one of the previous slides, the reward is assumed to fully indicate how well the agent is doing at time step k. And very important, this is one of the central hypotheses of reinforcement learning, that the agent and any software algorithm is trying to maximize its long-term reward. So we use here the expectation operation, of course, uh, as we said, uh, the reward might be a random variable, and so we're trying to maximize that ex expectation of all future rewards on an infinite horizon. The question here, which you may think about a minute, so you may pause this video shortly and think about situations where this reward hypothesis may conflict, especially in control type scenarios, and then may continue this video shortly after, we will catch up this question uh, in our comparison to model predictive control. So how could rewards look like? Some application examples. So if you want to flip a pancake, um, so you get a very likely positive reward if you're able to rotate the pancake and catch it successfully, and a negative reward if you drop it to the floor. If you do stock trading, your reward could be directly linked to the monetary value of your stock trading portfolio if it's increasing or decreasing over time. Then in games, a high score at the end of the level could be classically interpreted as also a reward. And in 
driving an autonomous car situation, you will get as an autonomous car agent a positive reward if you're getting your passenger safely from A to B without any crash. And uh, if you're hitting another car, pedestrian, bicycle, truck or something else on your way, of course, you will get a negative reward. In classical control tasks as the inverted pendulum or also electrical drives, they're similar. You will get a positive reward if you are able to follow a given reference directory, so given reference directory of, of set points, or you will get a negative reward, for example, if you're violating a system constraint or if you're only able to follow that reference signal with very large control errors. What are reward characteristics? So rewards come with very, very different flavors. One characteristic is the, let's say, temporal characteristics, actions, which will lead to rewards may have only a short time consequence or a long-term consequence. So if you consider stock trading, for example, or strategic board games, a certain decision you make today, you uh, maybe have to wait a long time. So in stock trading, maybe even years, in order to be able to evaluate how good or bad this decision was in the past. Then, as already discussed, rewards can be positive or negative. If you're doing something good, uh, the number will be positive. If you're doing something bad, so maybe you get a penalty, of course, that might be a negative number. And as we already discussed also, to summarize that again, there might be exogenous impacts in our environment which introduce stochastic reward components and therefore we always consider that reward as a random variable. And in general, just to summarize that also again, the learning process of any reinforcement learning agent, so any reinforcement learning algorithm, is heavily linked with the reward distribution over time. There might be situations where the reward distribution is very sparse, so for example in games you maybe only get one reward at the end of the game, or it might be also a dense distribution, so for example in continuous control problems where you get a reward for every time step. The problem here is that we cannot really state what is the best way in order to derive optimal reward functions, so therefore we have stated here the tale of King Midas, which uh, was converting everything he touched with his fingers to gold, so like here his daughters, so you really have to be careful uh, on the one hand what as an engineer you may be like to see your system doing so you may have some intuition uh, what a good system behavior could look like however the art is now to convert that belief that intuition on how your system should work into a mathematical formal description in that reward function there is no predefined way how to do that and therefore defining that reward function in a proper way is sometimes more art than science. Another flavor of returns or in general of reinforcement learning problems are so-called task dependent definitions. So one task could be episodic. So in this case, the problem naturally breaks down into subsequence, which we call episodes. So that's the case for most games. If a level ends, that episode is terminated. And in this case, our return, so the sum of future rewards, is becoming a finite sum from our first future reward until the nth future reward, which is our termination step. On the contrary, we can have continuing tasks where we don't have any natural end, so we have an infinite horizon, as already discussed, that could be a classical control task. And in this case, we will stick to that um, sum of infinite of an infinite horizon of our future rewards. However, in that case of continuing tasks, we normally introduce a so-called discount or discount rate gamma, which is a real number between zero and one. And uh, this uh, discount will help us, for example, to prevent infinite numbers here of that uh, series. So let's talk a little bit more about the discount because this is really an important parameter in reinforcement learning problems. So we already discussed the numeric viewpoint here just to summarize it again. If the uh, if it's not discounted, so gamma equals one and we have positive rewards for an infinite time of course then our return gets infinite so that is of course a numeric problem and the nice thing is now if we introduce a discount uh, smaller than one then um, for any air car which is bounded, then we can state that our uh, G, our return, is also bounded. So this is a nice advantage of using discounts from the numeric viewpoint. 
And from the strategic viewpoint, we can also have two perspectives. The first perspective is if I'm choosing a discount close to one, then I want to have an agent which is very far sighted. And on the contrary, if I'm choosing a gamma factor close to zero, I want to have an agent which is very short sighted. So the agent is only interested really in his short term immediate reward. Moreover, there are also interesting mathematical options in that return and reward definitions. One is that our current return g at time step k, so this equation we already saw in the previous slide, can be nicely rearranged in order to highlight that g k is equal to the future next reward r k plus 1 plus the discounted future return g k plus 1. And this um, yeah, expression here we will use also for some of our reinforcement learning algorithm in the next lectures. Finally, we can also use that geometric series here in case that we assume error car is always a constant equals error and we have a discount smaller than one, then we can use the geometric series to directly state the return by error times one divided by one minus gamma. And this special case can be, for example, useful if I can make an estimate on, for example, my best case reward I would assume over time. And uh, with that geometric series, I can then directly calculate the best possible return. And this goal can be then, for example, used in order to evaluate if my agent, which I'm training right now, uh, how far or how close that agent is in terms of that best possible case. And the geometric series here gives me an option to directly calculate that value without any complicated uh, other formulas, which we will then discuss in the next couple of lectures, because directly, directly writing down this uh, return is just a special case. Normally we need some estimation techniques in order to, to estimate GK. After discussing return and reward, we're now going to discuss the so-called state and we will first consider the so-called environment state. So what is happening inside our system we are going to interact with. Here the state we are denoting as capital S as a random variable or small x as its realization. Again, we consider the general case that the environment maybe has some stochastic influence. If you remember that helicopter example, there might be situations where the wind gust is present and pushing us some direction. And in some cases, this is, this is not present. So there might be random impacts. The environment state is a complete internal status representation of the environment, so complete representation uh, representation of all important information. So in physical systems that might be, for example, a car velocity or a motor current in, in electric drives. In games that might be the current situation on the board, for example, in chess or in financial situations that might be the stock market status. Regarding the envi environment state, we can distinguish different visibility degrees, which we also discuss shortly after a little bit more in details. So in general, the agent might see a full picture of the environment state, only a limited one or even no information. And in general, we consider that there might be also some fogginess or uncertainty regarding that observation, which could be, for example, measurement noise in a physical system. And therefore, we state in general, there might be some mapping between that um, internal state representation of the environment and the observations presented to the agent. And very important, we have to distinguish that uh, if the state information is of continuous kind, so we have an infinite number of possible state situations, or if it's a discrete state space where we only have a discrete number of dis different states to be distinguished. And also I would like to highlight here that footnote, which will be they are very important throughout the entire lecture series and also um, exercises. So we consider, as we already said, bold symbols as, uh, oh no, we didn't say that, yet, but I'm saying it now. So bold symbols are non-scalar multidimensional quantities. So anything which could be a vector matrix. So if you consider a physical system, there might be different physical quantities like velocities, positions, pressures, and so on, which are summarized in such a state vector. Therefore, um, we express it here as a bold symbol to highlight that um, possible multidimensional um, yeah, quantity. And as we already discussed, so capital symbols will denote random variables in general, whereas small symbols are denoting their realizations. Second viewpoint on state is from the agent's point of view. So with that index x uh, a, and so this is anything the agent is um, yeah, internally representing. 
In general, we cannot say that the environment state is exactly the same as the agent states. For example, there might be measurement noise, but there might be also additional states of the agents of the agent which is not part of the environment. So for example, if you consider an agent in terms of a proportional integral controller, a very classical linear controller, that integral state of course is something which is highlighting the behavior of that controller slash agent and uh, this is of course only an internal state representation of that agent and not of the environment not of the system we are interacting with yeah, the agent state is therefore fully condensing the information which is relevant for the next action of that agent and therefore is a uh, internal knowledge representation again also as with the environment state we can consider continuous situation with an infinite number of states or a discrete set of different agent states Next, I would like to highlight a very important uh, state characteristic, and therefore we first have to define the so-called history in the reinforcement learning setup. A history is a past sequence of all observations, action, and rewards, so that uh, series H here, which is given as the observations Y, R, and actions U, starting from the initial time step until our current time step. And the very important uh, state characteristic I've mentioned before is the so-called information or Markov state. So if a state is holding to that expression 1.7 then we call that state an information or Markov state. So what is basically stated here is that the transition probability going from the current uh, step to the next time step k plus 1, so the state transition probability is the same if I'm only aware of my current time step k plus 1 compared to the situation where I have a full knowledge of the entire history of state. And if I can relax the right hand side here to the left hand side, so if I can drop all the previous um, past events and I'm only aware or I, I need to be only aware of the most recent time step, then we call that an information or Markov state. And we will use that characteristic that the complete history is fully condensed in the last time step uh, in many, many reinforcement learning algorithms and we will also discuss the so-called Markov state and therefore and then derive from that Markov decision processes in the next lecture in more details. Examples for models or systems with that uh, Markov state characteristic are for example linear time invariant state space models where I also have a linear relationship between my uh, current time step uh, in terms of the state and the next time step. And uh, the same also applies to nonlinear time invariant state spaces. So I don't need that linear relationship between uh, the last and the next time step, but I just need a time invariant state space representation as denoted here also in this general nonlinear case. Another important reinforcement learning characteristic is a so called degree of observability. In one case, a so called full observability case, the agent directly observes the environment main state directly and if the state is Markov we call that a Markov decision process. The MDP will be handled deeply in the next lecture and therefore I will skip details at the current point of time. On the other hand there might be situations where the agent is only indirectly observing the environment state and doesn't get a full picture and we call that a partial observability. If the state of the environment is still Markov then we call it a partial observable MDP. Since POMDPs are much more harder to, to solve and to find techniques in order to get optimal decision out of that, we won't focus on POMDPs in that entire lecture series. However, there might be techniques such as estimators or observers in order to transfer uh, the POMDP back into a classical MDP, for example, by reconstructing that missing state information. PMDP examples might be technical systems with only limited sensors. So for example, to cut, to cut costs, I don't want to uh, measure all relevant state information and my agent has to then live just with a partial picture. In game situation, poker would be very classically a uh, classical example because I don't know the opponent's cards and the human health status would be an example where the uh, environment, environmental state information is so huge that I'm not able uh, to measure all of them because the system is just too complex. The next item on our vocabulary list is the so-called action and the action is basically the agent's output at each sample step k and therefore the degree of freedom in order to maximize the long-term reward. Here we can also distinguish major characteristics. One distinction would be if the action set is finite or continuous. So if it's finite, I'm just having a discrete number 
uh, out of actions the agent can choose off and in the continuous case that number would be infinite. There might be also situations where the action are deterministic or random. The random case would be for example if the agent um, is somehow relying on some device which is executing that action and that device between uh, the action and the environment may uh, introduce some randomness and therefore there could be situations where the action is also a random variable or also we will see uh, situations where the agent is exploring in an unknown environment and that explora exploration can be also done to a certain extent with random actions. There might be also limitations to the actions, so for example state dependent limitations that in uh, the chess game for example I cannot make a move with a certain chess piece if that chess piece was already uh, eliminated from the chess board. So examples for action would be taking a card in a blackjack game, so here I can only twist or stick, so obviously that would be a finite action set. In many physical systems, such as driving autonomous cars, normally the uh, actions are from the continuous domain, such as the accelerator pedal position, or there might be also situations which are in between, so for example buying stop auctions or trading a portfolio. In general we can state that Evaluating the action in state space, if it's discrete or if it's continuous, is very, uh, a very important first step in order to evaluate what kind of reinforcement learning algorithms can be applied to a certain system. And in this lecture we will first start with discrete action in state spaces because these types of problems are much more easier to handle compared to continuous action in state spaces, which um, have to be uh, addressed for example by deep reinforcement learning techniques using function approximators which will be the second part of this lecture series. Derived from the action we can also talk about the policy. So the policy pi is the agent's internal strategy on picking actions and mathematically speaking we can denote pi as a mapping either in the deterministic case so we directly map our current state to an action or in the stochastic case there might be also some probability distribution between our current state and then the applied action. This random distribution between states and actions might be also useful in exploration scenarios where I want to explore an unknown environment due to random actions. And in general, changing that mapping of states to action by the policy pi in order to maximize the long uh, term expected uh, reward is then all about reinforcement learning. Next, we want to have some uh, yeah, simple uh, examples on policy. Here we would have a classical linear control technique approach, having a PID controller acting on a plant or process in order to uh, follow a certain reference directory. And we can interpret that PID controller as a simple reinforcement learning agent. And that agent is then explicitly available or explicitly ex expressed by that uh, P, I and D gain. In that example, the reward could be defined by minus the squared or control error. So the best control or the best reward I could get is zero because in that case the control error would be zero as well. And any other non-zero control error between the actual uh, measurement and the reference would give them a negative reward. So the agent would try to minimize that uh, negative reward here by any means. Yeah, as mentioned, the agent's behavior is explicitly determined by that three parameters here, which can be uh, changed over time in order to find that optimal to policy, in order to find that yk star in an optimal fa fashion. And very important here in that uh, control scenario, what is the environment state? The environment state is depending on two quantities, of course, obviously on the uh, measurement here or on the internal and a representation of the measurement and also on the environment. So because the agent, so the agent is that PID controller, cannot really change that reference value here, it can only react on that reference value here and therefore that reference value is also part of the environment. And the control output, so at this yeah, uh, sum of the different control actions, UK, this is then the agent's uh, policy determined by that three game parameters and the current state situation. On the other hand, a stochastic policy is very often uh, applicable to games, so for example, Rock, Paper, Scissors, Lizard, Spock game, where a 
deterministic policy, so doing uh, the same kind of moves uh, all over again, would be of course easily exploited by the opponent. And in this case, applying some randomness to my actions will uh, increase my chance of winning. And actually one can show that in this simple case, a uniform random policy would be, of course, obviously very unpredictable and would also give us the maximum return in that example. Deriving from return reward and policy, we can also define and discuss the so-called value functions. The value functions come with two flavors. The first flavor is the so-called state value function, and it's defined as the expected return being in a state and then following a policy pi, and we denote that state value function as small v with that index pi in order to highlight that this uh, yeah, state value is defined for that policy pi. Mathematically speaking, if we assume an MDP structure, then we can state uh, that the state value is the expected return g being in a certain state x under policy pi, and we can rewrite that return here again as the infinite series of our future discounted rewards. So we will also discuss the state value in more, in more detail in the next lecture. However, what is here very important is that the agent will try to maximize this state value by changing that policy. The second flavor of value functions is the so-called action value, which is similar to the state value, but not the same. It's also the expected return being in the state X, but taking an action UK and then thereafter following that policy pi. And we denote that action value as Q with index pi being in state X and applying action UK. And mathematically speaking, also somehow similar. That is our the expected return being instead x applying action u and then after following policy pi or again written in this future discounted reward series. What is very important here on the action value is that this uh, action u doesn't have to be the same action which the policy would give us in that state x case. So it doesn't have to be uh, equal to the policy policy's choice and therefore we can do new steps we can to try to explore and then compare that action value with the action value we would have get just strictly following also for that first initial next move uk that policy pi and then compare okay which of these two action value functions are better and then maybe change our policy in the future because we have figured out a new random move which was not part of that policy yet was better compared to our current policy and we will use that comparison of different action values in order to optimize then the policy over time also in the next lectures. And in order to be able to improve that policy over time, estimating the state value and the action value is also a very critical task in reinforcement learning because normally we need to have a good estimate or ideally perfect knowledge about the two value functions in order to be able to improve the policy. And therefore an intermediate step in reinforcement learning is to use sample data and then apply estimates of V and Q. In some certain reinforcement learning problems, it might be also beneficial to first derive a model based on sample data, so on sampled interaction with the environment, and then use that model in order to derive an optimal policy. A model is always an mathematical description of the agent so it's not part of the environment it's a mathematical model or software inside the agent which is trying to predict what's happening next in the environment and this prediction can be either according to the state so we might get a state transition distribution from our current state applying a certain action and then that model would be that uh, random distribution here in order to make an estimate on the next state similar also the same idea could be extended to a reward model so we're in some certain state we're applying a certain action and then that model would be again that probability distribution of getting a certain reward in a very general sense again we are defining this here in a stochastic way however there might be situations for example that simplified PID controller where this model also relates to deterministic form and using data in order to fit a model is also a learning problem of its own. Of course, you can use it as an intermediate step for reinforcement learning, but there's also a research branch on its own, which is called system identification. And if you're interested more deeply into system identification topics, you're highly invited into one of our other lectures called system identification, obviously, which is offered by our department in the winter semester too. 
the last item on our vocabulary list is the so-called exploration exploitation dilemma and this is the strategic dilemma of an a reinforcement learning agent being dropped in an initially unknown environment. So here's the question, how much do I have to weight exploration movements? So to apply movements which make, don't give me a high instantaneous reward, but give me new information about the environment. So going into states, visiting states which I never have visited before, or should I do more exploitation? So should I visit states and apply action where I completely know based on my limited information that this uh, actions and this states will give me a rather high reward. And this trade-off problem to splitting up my, act my actions between these two strategies is really an unsolved problem of reinforcement learning, especially for very complex action and state spaces. And we will discuss strategic choices on that exploration exploitation dilemma throughout the entire lecture series at different points. Since you are now familiar with the basic terms of reinforcement learning, we will now distinguish main categories in order to solve reinforcement learning problems. And we want to distinguish these different approaches by this mass example provided by David Silver in his uh, reinforcement learning lecture. And the objective of that maze, of course, is that an agent is starting in that starting tile here in the top and then is trying to move throughout that maze in the shortest amount of time, leaving it at this goal tile. The problem statement is as follows. So for every time step, uh, independent of the position of that agent, the reward is minus one. So this basically expresses that the agent should move out of the maze as quick as possible. The um, problem is of course of episodic form. So if I'm at the goal, the episode is terminated. The actions are discrete, so I can only go north, east, south, and west in any time step and then will move uh, one step forward. The state is just already determined by the agent's location inside that maze, and it's a deterministic problem, so we don't model any stochastic influences here. And in the following, we use that maze example to evaluate three different opportunities to find an optimal way of um, solving that problem here. The first way is the, let's say, explicit way. So I'm trying to model directly a policy pi, which could be represented by that arrows here. So for every position in that maze, I will have a direct information. Okay, if I'm here in that starting node, I should go right. And then if I'm here, I'm going top and then right, right, right again, and so on. So in this case, the optimal choices in order to, to go to the goal state in the shortest amount of time would be directly available by that policy on the current position x. Second solution could be based on value functions. I would call that an indirect or implicit solution approach with the value functions or with the value function for each of the different uh, positions here. I can highlight that being at the beginning of the maze, of course, gives you a worse value as compared to be at the end of the maze because being at the start, you need more time steps to find the way out of the maze compared to be at one of these ending tiles here. The value function is just an implicit or indirect way in order to find an optimal choice because being in sub position, so for example, being here at that position uh, with a value of minus 15, I have to make a one step ahead prediction in order to compare the state values of my different actions. So at that position, I could go north, so I get minus 14, could go west minus 16 or I could go south minus 16 again. So comparing these three choices I have at that position, I would do that one step prediction and determine that going north would be my best option here. So reinforcement learning solution by value function is possible. Therefore, I need that value function information and have to do a one step look ahead search. Last but not least option in order to find an optimal way through that maze could be by model evaluation. So the agent has an internal mathematical slash software based model of the whole environment in order to interact just with that model, but not with the environment to find an optimal way. So it tries to make full predictional rollouts in order to find best trajectories to find the best way out of that maze. 
So that internal model of the agent might not be perfect, as we can see here in that example. So there are parts of the environment which are not covered by that model, and there are also wrong information. Um, there's also wrong information inside that model. For example, the problem statement uh, was that every uh, in every time step we get a, a negative reward of minus one, and in this example, the model of the agent believes that in some positions you get a negative reward even of minus two or minus four. However, we can use that model then to interact with the model, so to do complete rollouts, predictions, in order to find the best optimal way to uh, get the way out of the maze. So if we summarize that here in that figure, we can see that we have largely with three different possibilities. We can either indirectly try to estimate a value function, and from that value function you do one step ahead prediction to get the best optimal choices. We could directly try to find a policy in order to have a best optimal action for every state, or we can also try to have a model and then use planning or prediction in order to find best choices. There are of course also intermixing solutions, like for example actor critic methods, which we will then discuss throughout the entire lecture series. The last topic of today's lecture will be a small comparison of reinforcement learning compared to model predictive control. As I mentioned, this lecture will have also a focus on control problems, and in this domain, model predictive control is also a classical solution candidate for optimal decision making. And for this comparison, I would like to start with a simplified, let's say, extreme comparison, where we are trying to distinguish the two extreme scenarios on how reinforcement learning can be thought and how planning, so slash model predictive control, can be interpreted. In the simplified comparison, we could state that, of course, both techniques are fundamental solutions to sequential decision making. However, reinforcement would have a strong emphasis on learning. So we start with uh, no information about the environment. So the environment for the agent is initially unknown, and the agent will learn about the internal dynamics of the system by interacting with the environment and then improving its policy based on that feedback, so basically on that reward. Planning slash model predictive control, on the other hand, works with the classical assumption that we have a very accurate a priori model of our environment, and the agent will use that a priori model, interact with the model, in order to find optimal trajectories to solve a certain control problem. So this agent, for example, could use a numerical solver in order to yeah, interact with that given model and then to find optimal, for example, action trajectories. So I would call that, for example, then trying to maximize that virtual reward. So in that simplified comparison, we would state that reinforcement learning and planning slash model predictive control are two extreme cases. So reinforcement learning would be all about learning without using any available pre-knowledge. And on the other hand, planning would be iterating on an internal model of the environment with, uh, without improving that model based on data. And of course, the question is, can one of these two strategies lead to efficient and optimal solution? And I believe, obviously, the answer is no. And therefore, we are trying to evaluate now the differences and similarities of reinforcement learning and model predictive control and to see where, say, these two things can be combined together very nicely. Therefore, I would first like to do a problem reconsideration of our initial reinforcement learning problem, which was stated by the reward hypothesis. And if we rearrange that reward hypothesis, we can nicely see that if we interpret R as uh, costs and not as rewards anymore, that reward hypothesis was already an infinite horizon optimal control problem. So in that case, if we reinterpret R now as costs, we can state that an optimal a control problem is minimizing our costs by applying optimal actions over an infinite horizon control problem. Normally we can only find in special cases a closed form solution to that infinite horizon optimal control problem. For example, if we are operating on a linear time invariant system with quadratic costs and no further constraints, in this case we would get a closed form solution by a linear quadratic regulator, for example. However, I believe in 95 of the cases, especially in practical cases, these simplified assumptions won't hold. We will have any, let's say, nonlinearity, we will have constraints, and so on. And in this case, we cannot get a closed form solution, but we need to relax our problem to a finite horizon problem, which is then really the 
model predictive problem of its own. So what will happen is that this uh, prediction horizon NP is our look, uh, look ahead horizon on which we are predicting with our internal model of the environment what will happen. And this prediction, for example, then can be used in terms of using a um, quadratic solver or convex solver in order to find that optimal action trajectory. One major distinction uh, I really would like to highlight comparing model predictive control and reinforcement learning is that in the model predictive control case, we can nicely directly represent constraints inside our problem definition. So if you reconsider the report hypothesis of the reinforcement learning case, there was just the idea of maximizing the long-term reward and that's it. So we didn't talk about any constraints. And this is really a drawback of reinforcement learning that there is no way to directly incorporate constraints. We can only indirectly incorporate them, for example, by trying to integrate constraints into the cost function or reward function, for example, by so-called barrier functions or penalty functions. In model predictive control, on the other hand, we are able to directly state such constraints, so boundary conditions, for, for example, that the state during the prediction horizon has to be in some feasible set, or also that the actions have to be in some uh, limiting set, which we are defining beforehand. And then we just have to look for an appropriate solver, which is able to cope with such constraint optimization problems. And we uh, get a solution which will on the one hand minimize our costs and on the other hand will stick to these constraints on states and actions for example. So this is really a big difference here between reinforcement learning, no direct inclusion of constraints and model predictive control where I have that option. So if you're trying to summarize model predictive control and reinforcement learning properties, then we can do that in the following table. So first um, comparison here regarding the objective is more or less a philosophy uh, kind of comparison. So MPC tries to minimize cost where reinforcement learning tries to maximize the return. However, it can exchange both by just multiplying them by minus one. So maximizing the return is directly minimizing the cost if I'm just multiplying uh, the one by minus one. Then the question of a priori modi we already have discussed also before. So in model predictive control, it's really required to have an a priori model. So that might be a problem in situations where I don't have that knowledge. And in reinforcement learning, due to that adaptive data-driven interactive way between agent and uh, reinforcement learning environment, that a priori is not required and the agent will just learn and maybe model by its own or directly an optimal policy on, on databases. Pre-knowledge integration on the other way, in model predictive control, yeah, we need that model so we can directly integrate any pre-knowledge of the system we had in reinforcement learning that is a little bit more complicated. We may discuss that in the later lectures. Buzzwords would be here, for example, imitation learning, which would lead to some pre-training of an agent based on pre-knowledge, and then this agent is applied to the real system in a second step. Constraint handling, we have just discussed the slide before, so an MPC inherently possible and reinforcement learning only indirectly possible. Adapt adaptive uh, activity is therefore also um, a major difference between the both strategies here, so in reinforcement learning, due to the interaction between agent and environment. We have an inherent adaptivity if my system is changing, I will see that changing behavior inside my data stream and my agent can react on it. In model predictive control, if I'm working with a fixed model, um, that's not really adaptive, so I need to have some add-ons. So for example, disturbance observers or online capable system identification techniques in order to account for that ad adaptivity. So model predictive control on its own, it's not really adaptive, it needs some add-ons. Online complexity, so in generally speaking, both approaches, model predictive and control and reinforcement learning can be considered as rather high compared to other control techniques, for example, linear control techniques. However, I would state that model predictive control in general has a high online complexity because we need that solver, which is solving complex numerical tasks under real-time conditions. So we're doing all that predictions uh, with that internal model and we're trying to evaluate an optimal trajectory based on these predictions together with that solver. And that needs to be online um, real-time capable and normally that will lead to a high online complexity. 
in reinforcement learning, uh, on the other side, we have somehow a little bit degree of freedom because in reinforcement learning, we have to differentiate the learning step and the execution step of the policy. So the learning, for example, could be done in a, let's say, a slower task in an asynchronous fashion, whereas, of course, the execution of the policy rule has to be done under real-time constraints, of course. So they have a little bit more degree of freedom to do the learning in an asynchronous way, whereas in model predictive control, it's not really possible to do the uh, prediction in an asynchronous way because otherwise I will lose track. I won't, um, yeah, I will get, for example, controller overflows, controller task overruns, and so on. Last point to be discussed in this, uh, in this list is stability theory. So with model predictive control, we have a nice mature stability theory. So I can design controllers for certain problems or for many problems. And I know if I'm sticking to that design rules, I will have a stable controller. So very important uh, property here of the uh, MPC type controllers. And in reinforcement learning, we don't have that uh, stability theory really available at hand. And this means, or this leads to the consequence that we really have to do a lot of testing. So we have to do a lot of tests in order to find out if a designed reinforcement learning agent is able to be stable inside a given environment, inside a given control problem. So this is a really a, a big drawback of reinforcement learning. However, to sum that up, so model predictive control and reinforcement learning, both trying to make optimal decisions, different philosophies, different drawbacks and advantages, on both sides. And it should be noted that we won't cover model predictive control in this lecture. This comparison is just to give you a broad scope about the advantages, disadvantages, similarities, differences of these two techniques. We will focus completely on reinforcement learning because it's such a big topic on its own and we need all the lecture time and the exercise time to cover reinforcement learning on a good basis. If you're interested more in model predictive control, there are several lectures on their own on model predictive control in the uh, engineering department of electrical engineering as well as in the mechanical engineering department. So please have a look in the uh, poll system in order to find additional lectures which will focus on these uh, alternative techniques in the model predictive control domain. Yeah, to sum up that today's lecture, what you have learned. First, of course, you have learned the role of reinforcement learning in the machine learning branch, besides supervised learning and unsupervised learning, and uh, as a potential tool in order to make optimal decisions, not only in control problems, as discussed in the, follow in the previous slide, but also in a broad sense, for example, in games, in stock trading, in robotics, and so on. You've got to know with the basic interaction loop of reinforcement learning. So the agent is interacting with its environment and also via an interpreter, it's getting a feedback of rewards and observations. You have got to know the basic items of the reinforcement learning vocabulary, which we'll use throughout the entire lecture. So things like state, action, policy, value functions, and so on are now familiar for you. You have learned that designing the reward function will be very will be a complex but also a very important topic because there is no predefined way in order to in that uh, reward function to uh, stop the reinforcement learning process. You have differentiated solutions on reinforcement learning so that the reinforcement learning agent can try to make optimal decisions either directly based on a policy, indirectly based on uh, value functions, or also based on models. And last but not least, the final discussion was on limiting reinforcement learning to model predictive control as an alternative tool for sequential decision making, especially obviously in control scenarios. And with this summary of that today's lecture, that's pretty much it for today. I would like to thank you for your attention and again highlight that at this time this video is being uploaded, there should be also the first exercise materials available in your Panda folder, which will cover the basics of Python. As already mentioned during that first lecture today, Python will be our main programming language for all subsequent exercises on reinforcement learning and also on the mandatory homework assignment. So if you're not a pro in Python, please use that time of the first exercise weeks, first course weeks in order to get more familiar with Python. And if you have any questions to that, please uh, use our Panda forums. Or also, if you have any question to that uh, today's lecture, of course, please use the Panda forums in order to ask the questions. We will discuss it there with you and your fellow students will also benefit from such a public discussion. 
So once again, thank you for your kind attention and see you soon. Bye-bye.